OCD to me is having a graveyard in your brain of the things that you once loved, that OCD waged a war upon and just decimated. OCD is a nightmare of a mental illness that has derailed my life. OCD for me has been an evil, crippling monster. A monster in your head that is hell-bent, primally influenced and primally motivated to target and kill everything that you love. What is OCD to you? Feels like you're treading water sometimes, but you can't reach the bottom or reach the top. You're like at that in-between part where you feel like you're drowning. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really pull yourself out of it. And you feel like a bunch of bricks on your shoulders and you can never truly come above. But once you do and you do see that light, it's a little different and you view things differently. I think for me, what OCD is, is your brain is just hyperactive and it's constantly looking and scanning for things, telling you consistently that something's dangerous in your environment. And so you're always on edge, you're always trying to protect yourself and you come up with these behaviors and avoidances to keep yourself safe. OCD is a disorder in which you're obsessing and compulsing for at least an hour or more a day. Mm -hmm. And your, your life is literally being restricted as if like you're being killed by a boa constrictor. It's like, it's this tightening mm -hmm. sensation. In essence, suffering with OCD is like being in hell. Mm. And it's a hell that you're aware of, which makes it really difficult. Unlike a lot of mental disorders, there's this dual existence between this healthy part of your brain and the OCD, and they're existing simultaneously. So the healthy part of your brain is going, everything that you're thinking and everything that you're, you want to do compulsively is illogical and it makes no sense whatsoever. But then the OCD part of your brain is going, you have to do this or this is going to happen. Right. And you listen to the OCD part of your brain, knowing that it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but you just want to get rid of that feeling. If anybody would have asked me uh, if I thought I had a mental illness, I would have said, not me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I just had no idea. Um, and so uh, it took a while for me to really come to terms with knowing something was wrong and wanting to do something about mm -hmm. it. I was very secretive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as I got older, uh, I became more transparent. As a mom, what does, what does Chris's OCD mean to you? I had no idea um, if he would get better. I had no idea if um, he would have a regular life, if there was treatment that could help him. Um, so it was a very scary time to think that a totally normal person had become almost like a toddler. One thing about the disorder is it doesn't just hit you all at once, it slowly consumes you until it gets to a point that's overwhelming. There were so many moments when I was younger, especially in high school, full-fledged um, OCD, but at the time you just don't realize what it is. The definition of OCD are obsessions, right? So mm -hmm. Thoughts images, feelings on a loop that we don't want to have. They make us uncomfortable. They give us anxiety, a really uncomfortable feeling. And then to alleviate that feeling, we engage in a compulsion, washing your hands, tapping, praying, a variety of things. That compulsion alleviates the anxiety from the thought. The vicious loop is that it only alleviates the anxiety for a short time. After a while, the thoughts come back, the fears come back, the emotion and anxiety comes back, and you re-engage in the compulsion. And over time, the amount that it alleviates the pain is shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until you're compulsing constantly because you're just trying to get that sense of relief. I think that people also assume that OCD is just OCD. And you don't have anything else. But along with obsessive compulsive disorder comes a reign of emotions of anxiety, depression, um, intrusive thoughts, suicidal thoughts. And people don't really know that because people don't talk about it. I first noticed OCD when I was eight years old. I've had symptoms of it since I was five years old. I first noticed OCD when I was 12 years old. 
I had something like this all through college. I had something like this all through high school. I had something like this all through middle school. I first noticed my OCD when I was in eighth grade. When I was 13, I had a massive intrusive thought that sent me into a panic attack, emotional breakdown. It was ground-breaking fear that stopped me in my tracks. One day I was okay, and then the next day I was obsessed, and I couldn't stop being obsessed. So when did it start showing up in your life? It, as early as I could form words and talk and make complete thoughts, I think it was present. When I was in kindergarten, there was an eclipse of the sun. And the teacher was telling us that if we wanted to watch the eclipse, we had to do it this certain way, because otherwise you can't stare at the sun because you'll go blind. And I became obsessed that my mother was going to look at the sun and go blind. So I came home and I told her, you can't look at the sun, you can't watch the sun, you can't go outdoors. I didn't want to leave her side. I wanted to protect her to make sure that she wasn't going to look at the sun and go blind. And we went through all kinds of, you know, I'm going to wear a sign or you can call me. I ended up not going to school the day of the eclipse to stay with her to make sure that she wouldn't look at the sun. 11 years old and I was in the cafeteria and we had these like sausage pizzas and everybody had one. And I remember someone grabbing the sausage off the pizza and like squeezing it and it like exploded and it got all over me. A normal kid would be like, oh my God. But I was like, there's definitely germs all over me and oh. I'm probably gonna die from a sausage pizza. And wow. like as crazy as that sounds, that's how I knew that something wasn't right. About junior year of high school was when I first started to have thoughts about men because I'd been dating a girl for a few years. So we broke up and then I started to have these same-sex thoughts, and I would obsess over them mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have them. So I started to obsess about everything. If I had a bad thought about somebody, I would have to tell them and apologize for having that thought mm -hmm. about them when, at the end of the day, it's just a thought. It was high school when it really started to hit. I just felt like I had to do these rituals to stay safe. It was just something that I can't always explain to people, but my gut, my brain, everything in my body had made an agreement that I had to do all this ritualistic stuff. So I started bleaching everything I owned. I started doing all this cleaning and, and separating and isolating. What was sad is like with my sister, who I'm close with as well, and then my mom, like we were so close, but I kept pushing them away because these rituals started to become more important. And I think that was the hardest part is I didn't really have a name or an understanding of what it was. So that's where a lot of the anger and frustration came as well, as I felt I had to do these things, but nobody was telling me like, hey, you don't, it's a disorder. And so it made me really angry. Um, I turned mm -hmm. to like alcohol and and drugs to kind of self-medicate. And I think my mom treated it just like a bad teenager. And mm. so we really just lost our relationship and we're fighting a lot. And our relationship was really just yelling, screaming, and punishing. I went to go see my first therapist in 2009, mm -hmm. but I got my actual diagnosis in 2011. I would wake up and I would think my eyes are wrong, my nose is swollen, my ears are upside down. And I knew it wasn't a natural thing and I was just scared to death. I really thought that I had almost every disease that I heard about religious OCD. So really being afraid of offending God, being afraid I was going to hell, being afraid I wasn't a good Christian, trying to be perfect. I also suffered from incest OCD, so being afraid I was attracted to my family members and felt like I couldn't be around them. Homosexual OCD, thinking that I might be gay and not wanting that as a 12 and 13 year old. In my mind, I truly believed I was being punished and had done something wrong, so most of my compulsions were around the religious piece with repentance and prayer, but also very much avoidance and rumination and mentally reviewing on the sexual intrusive thoughts. One of my compulsions was to stay home from school because I thought I was sick, and no one really understood what was going on because I kept saying that something was physically wrong with me. I would count to 105 whenever my mom was out. I counted to 105, thinking that it would keep her safe. Uh, I washed my hands upwards of 500 times a day. Uh, and I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know why I was washing my hands so often. I just knew that they had to be cleaned, and they were never clean enough. It's very hard on the siblings, because my daughter would be quiet so that she wouldn't be more trouble. And, you know, she did that for many years, that she just kind of faded away so that all the attention was on Chris. 
and we just were trying to get him through without getting arrested or doing something horrible, just get him through his teenage years. You know, it's funny because we don't always, I think, um, you know, talk about this period. And I know, um, obviously at the time, it was just a lot of selfishness because I just felt like I had to do these things and I was in danger, but hearing my mom, mm, talking about it, knowing the pain that I put my mom and my sister through, you kind of just don't remember that. You were so in a, in a place of like confusion and anger and turning to alcohol and drugs, which is not gonna help the situation. And, you know, having my mom feel like, okay, how do I parent and what do I do? Putting someone through hell. And that's like a regret I always have. And obviously I didn't know, um, but just knowing that I put my mom, my sister, my family through that. First, second, third, fourth grade, they were really hard. I mean, I was just constantly afraid of everything. I was afraid of swallowing. Every day going to school was a massive battle, crying, screaming. I would fake illnesses. I would fake, I would do anything to just stay at home and not go to school because of just all these fears and thoughts and bombarding my head constantly. If I'm being really honest, mm -hmm. I was in denial of, I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be not like the normal kids in my school where, you know, they could do whatever they wanted when they got off school, but instead I had to go and wash my hands 10 million times till my skin fell off because I was contaminated. I had a public face and that was, I was going to school, I was working as a waiter, I had friends, but I, behind the scenes on my own, I was spending hours and hours doing all these obsessing and compulsive behaviors and then it just got too overwhelming. I couldn't do it anymore. I wasn't able to show up to certain schedules at work. I couldn't make it at certain times. That's wow. when everything went downhill because now I didn't have a job to get to. I didn't have school to get to. I was living on my savings and just every single day I was waking up. I had rituals I had to do throughout the entire day, compulsions, obsessing, and then I'd get so tired and exhausted and finally fall asleep. I had this terrible fear of illness in high school. I carried three thermometers around with me every day and took my temperature 80, 90 times a day. A headache was a brain tumor and a fever was meningitis and it was just all this extreme health anxiety. And I couldn't leave the house certain days. My anxiety was skyrocket to where um, I couldn't even say my name sometimes in a public environment because I had to count how many people were in the room, mm -hmm. how many people I could hurt, how many people would be around me if I just fell dead on the floor, who would help me? And those aren't, those are thoughts that I was thinking, but when I talk about them now, I'm like, how could I have ever thought those things? But they're so normal for people like me. The time from diagnosis to treatment, actual treatment was 17 years. So I didn't receive the proper treatment, exposure response prevention, and other treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, until I was 30 years old. I kept OCD a secret starting day one up until I was 20 years old. I kept my OCD a secret for a long time. I kept it a secret from my mom. I kept it a secret from my friends. Unintentionally kept it a secret for a long time um, because I didn't understand what was going on. Yes, a huge secret for almost two decades. Even after my diagnosis, I kept parts of it a secret. Thinking you might molest a child, how do you tell someone that? Thinking you might be attracted to your own mom, how do you tell someone that? I kept OCD a secret for 20 years because the content of my obsessional thoughts were so scary and so intrusive that I didn't think anybody would understand what was going through my head. I thought that if I were to talk about what was going on in my head, that I was going to be locked up, misunderstood. I got so sick with OCD that I became completely bedridden. It was really, really dark. I was doing OCD things that I had never done before, like hand washing. I'd become afraid that I was accidentally gonna poison myself. What if I hit my head? What if I gave myself a brain bleed? What if I was gonna die? I'd got five CAT scans in a week at five different hospitals. I, I had to go to a, an acute psychiatric facility and they diagnosed me as psychotic. They didn't even die. I was at a professional acute psychiatric facility and they told my parents that he does not have OCD, he's psychotic. And it was terrifying. It was the most terrifying place I've ever been. I, I got really, really depressed. I mean, to a level of depression I came and described where the only reason I got out of bed was to do the compulsions, but I didn't feel like there was any out. It was to a point where I just felt dark every day and I just didn't have the will to live. And so um, this is always hard to talk about in front of her, but um, it got to a point that I just couldn't do it anymore. I just really couldn't. And 
it's, I think the saddest part is because my mom and I were so close and my sister and I were so close and obviously like I should have reached out at that point. There are so many times where I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just not do this anymore. But uh, I mean, obviously I only can ever think back to one time where I truly wanted to end it all, which was May of last year. But other than that, you know, you, you tend to just not want to go through it anymore because it's just painful. It's not something that you'd ever wish even on your worst enemy. Since I was a teenager, I've been in and out of treatment about four times. There were two big events that happened. Um, the first time when I was about um, 19, I had a few suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And then again, when I was 21, um, they were really cry for helps, but on legal document, they would probably be called suicide attempts. It took a little bit of time to like get up the courage to, to commit suicide, but mm -hmm. um, I just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. So um, we had a garage that we only used for storage and I pulled everything out of it and drove my car in the garage. And so I ran the car and I just left myself to die. And from what I know, from what my roommate told me, because I had a roommate at the time, and she told me that she like went in, tried to like kind of get a hold of me or, or make enough noise to get me up and I just wouldn't move. And that she ended up calling 911. And all I remember is like, somebody asking me if I was okay and then remembering being in like a hospital. I was like really, really upset and confused and I had finally come up with my own personal solution to this hell that I was dealing with at all times. And it kind of gotten taken away from me and I remember them like, I remember kind of like, oh no, I just fell asleep. Like I just wanted them to leave me alone. And I was kind of thinking, how am I gonna do this again? And they had told me at the hospital, they're like, you need to be living with someone, you need to get some help. And I remember telling myself, like, I need to have a conversation with my mom because I'm gonna attempt again. I don't, nothing's gonna get better. And so we set up a time and I remember um, being in her living room and kind of sitting her down and just telling her that I attempted suicide and I need help. And it was funny because like, she had a way different reaction than I thought. I thought that she would just be like, flip in or brush me off because we had such a bad relationship at that time. And I remember her crying and you know, being really worried. And that's when she kind of jumped in and just told me, like, we need to get you help. And, and so the process of finding a therapist was really, really tough, but I just kept saying yes to anything my mom would ask because I just was at that point where I couldn't put her through the pain that I saw when I told her. I would never have known what was going on. I would never have known what happened. I would never have had a clue why he did it. Yeah, so we just, that was the only focus, just finding him a therapist, finding help. I always think of that, like if I would have done it, there was no no, you know, I mean, that crushes me now, is if I would have gone through with it, and she had no idea, and I know her, she would have blamed herself. That's but, I mean, we all, all moms blame themselves. We should have seen it. I should have known it when he was three, you know. I should have been able to see it. The shame and the embarrassment and the guilt of the thoughts, the fear of this really must mean that I'm a bad person. I was terrified to let my parents know. And it took a really long time, a really long time, because I just thought I was a bad person. I didn't know it was a treatable disorder. It's like, you can't treat immorality. I thought, you know, you can't treat being a bad person. You you are, you aren't, um, and I tried not to be. I never told my mom or my dad what the real thoughts were and what I was really worried about. I kept it to myself for a year until I couldn't anymore. I truly thought that my friends would not want to be my friend anymore if I told them. The person that I kept it a secret from the longest was my mom because I thought that she would be ashamed of me. I thought that I'd be a disappointment. I thought that she'd be embarrassed. I had no idea that I was living with a mental illness. I truly believed that in the scrupulous piece that I was doing something wrong and God was punishing me. I can't even imagine the healing and growing and also getting treatment and figuring out what kind of treatment. What a Did the road seem long? For you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because 
I think the way that my mom shows love is she doesn't show it like in a traditional way of like warmth. And I've learned like my mom, <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but she shows it by action. Mm -hmm. My dad went online and we found the um, International OCD Foundation. We started to to find resources and it turned out that there was a clinic 20 minutes from my house where I'd lived for 14 years. I first went there. I went to the right place. I sat down on the sofa and the therapist said, we hear you, we understand you. We know exactly what you're going through and we can help you. Did you believe them? No. I bet you did. Not at all. Like I wanted help, but every other therapist had told me that. Why should I believe them? So therapy was difficult. I would feel like when I sat down in the chair at the, my therapist's office, I remember him saying, okay, what are we gonna do today? What are we gonna do to, to, to say hello to the OCD? Like bring it out. And that was traumatizing for me. Mm. I mean, it's exposure response therapy. You're exposing yourself to your biggest issues and your biggest triggers, bringing them to the surface and dealing with them. Mm. The treatment for OCD is exposure response prevention, ERP, where they expose you to your fears. When they expose you to your fears, instead of compulsing, you resist the compulsion. You sort of engage the anxiety and the discomfort and the uncomfortable feelings and you sit with it until it starts to go down. And then you trigger yourself again. And you do that over and over again. And what happens is it's called habituation. Mm. And so eventually over time, the more you expose yourself to what you're afraid of, you start to habituate and respond less and less. I started therapy and I love my therapist now. She triggers me more than I have ever been triggered in my life. I remember when I went to my first therapy session, I remember walking in and thinking, I would give a million dollars if I had some sunglasses because I was so occupied with who might see me than getting well. Because of the suicide attempts, waiting six months or eight months wasn't an option. And I remember um, my mom found a, a treatment center and they called me and just wanted to make sure that I was on board as well. And I was still at that point where I wasn't on board and happy and excited, but I just was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes, I guess, because I don't have another option and you know talking to them about once a week and and the therapist saying like you know because that was all we could afford and because of the distance and you know I remember her asking me like you're gonna have to do a lot of the hard work at home because you sound severe you probably need more but you're gonna have to do the hard work at home and I was like I'll do anything and so that's kind of how our treatment started. How did you get better? I got better because a bunch of people that loved me didn't give up on me. My therapist decided the best thing for me was to get out away from my parents and go to this residential program in Boston, Massachusetts. Did this program for two and a half months. And then one day we did an exposure where my therapist made me hit my head. And then he's like, okay, great. Now go to town and go get a haircut and live your life. I got to down, I was middle of the getting a haircut and I, I convinced myself that I had a bleed. And I jumped up from the haircut in the middle of it and ran out. And again, not 100% of me believed, but I, but enough, of, but it enough of it believed that it wasn't willing to take the chance. So I went behind an apartment complex and I, I found a rock, a sharp rock, and I cut my head open right here. And it wasn't to hurt, that wasn't to hurt myself. It was just to sell that I had fallen on the ice and hit my head. So then I cut my head open, I walked around, found a snowbank on the curb, and I literally just laid face first in the snowbank and pretended to be passed out until a passerby came and found me and called 911. But I'll, I remember I was in the back of the ambulance. They had my phone and they called my dad and I just remember him screaming, do not take him to the hospital. He's faking it, he's lying. He's, 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 a, he's a patient at, at this residential program. Whatever you do, don't take him to the hospital. And I heard the EMT go, he has a cut on his head. And I was like, ah, I knew that would come in handy. But I mean, looking back on it, the illness was so, I mean, it's so sick. Mm. It's so sick. And it wasn't to hurt anyone and it wasn't to, to fake anyone out. And it was, it was to save myself. Mm -hmm. Went to the hospital, got a CAT scan. They were like, you're fine. And I went, okay, it's, it's a heroin addict getting his fix. Trying to find a therapist, call, make appointments, get there would have never happened without her support. And so having my mom really take this seriously, I think that was like a big part of it is my mom took it seriously. So I started to take it seriously and then getting the information initially like, hey, this is a the debilitating disorder. This is what's going on in your brain and your body and getting an understanding. And then having my mom always be there, like we're going, you're going to therapy. And I never missed a session, I was always there. <laughs> and uh, that is one of the reasons that he got better. He did a lot of hard work. Um, I just got him there and um, 
We don't know how. He tells me that he thought he didn't have a choice. I'm less than 5'2", so I don't know why he thought I could do anything, but he, I guess it was in my face. Mm -hmm. You're getting in the car and right. we're going. And I went into the office and all my treatment team was there and my parents and my treatment team in Florida were there on the other line. And they basically said, we have a plan. And the plan is you're not allowed to come back to Florida. If you come back to Florida, you'll be arrested and you have to stay in Boston and make a brand new life and you can't have any relationship with your parents anymore. And if you do that, then you can continue to get treatment and therapy and people will you know, support you. But if not, you're just completely on your own. I, they backed me in a corner I couldn't get out of. And three days later, I moved into this disgusting I call crack house in the south side of Boston that I found on Craigslist. And it was terrifying. I got into the room and I closed the bedroom door and I literally pushed the dresser up against the door and I got into bed and I laid there for six days. And I didn't eat and I didn't drink and I didn't take my medications and I was going to the bathroom and I was, I was paralyzed and petrified. On day six, I had a couple of realizations. The first realization was that nobody was coming for me. And that was a terrifying realization because if I kept doing what I was doing, then I was gonna die. Right. Well, then I had to ask myself if I wanted to live or I wanted to die. And so I dug really deep and asked myself that question. And I felt like I had nothing to live for anymore. Everything was taken away from me. And I had this terrible illness that I couldn't get rid of. I was broken, I was unfixable, I was unmendable. But despite all of those things, there was this thing inside of me that was like, you can't die. Like, you can't kill yourself. You, this can't be for nothing. The next thought was, well, what do I do? How do I, how do, how do I go about doing this? And the first thought was like, well, you have to go out and get out of bed and go buy food and, you right. know, all this stuff. I got out of bed and I thought, well, you know, oh my God, what if I hit my head on the headboard? But suddenly, the fear of maybe dying, maybe not dying, paled in comparison to the certainty that I was going to die if I kept staying in bed and not eating and not taking care of myself and just letting myself wither away and die. And suddenly survival became more important than the mm. OCD. And that was the epiphany. What is the best thing that you can do for someone that is in the, in the throes of it and in the, getting a diagnosis and learning how to navigate it for themselves? When he started therapy, the therapist talked to me and she gave me some information on how I could best support him because the support that a family gives is counterintuitive. It is completely opposite of what you expect to do as a mother. So if you don't get that education, you don't get that information, you continue to harm your child by doing what feels so natural. So, um, and that's one of the reasons that a support group helps is because as a mom, you're doing things that feel really bad. And then you can talk to other moms who say, no, it's gonna work, it's gonna work. Just stay in there. Very, very slowly, I started to do small things. I started to eat. I started to get outside. I took a train and a bus to go visit the therapist. I started going to the therapist, saw them three times a week. And then I noticed this exponential growth. After four or five months, my therapist suggested I reach out to my parents. I reached out to my parents. We started emailing. We started talking on the phone. They came to visit. August came around. I was like, can I, can I, I don't have to stay here anymore, right? I can go live my life and follow my dreams wow. and do everything that I want. I went home for two weeks, uh, visited my family, and I moved out to California to sort of follow my dreams. I was first treated with evidence based treatment when I was 15 years old. So that was three years after my symptoms started and two years after I was diagnosed. I first uh, started evidence-based treatment when I was in my mid-20s. I had a lot of attempts at, at evidence-based treatment that were unsuccessful uh, because of how scary it was, but it was when I was in my later 20s that I really buckled down. My first um, bout with evidence-based treatment was my first experience with therapy. Very blessed that my very first time in therapy, I got evidence-based treatment. So I first had my first OCD symptomology when I was 10 years old. 
and I wasn't until 32 until I first uh, was uh, successfully and properly diagnosed with OCD. So that's 22 years. Yeah, that's OCD. That's a thing. It's treatable. We can do a lot for you. Ever want anyone to wait as long as I waited and to wait as long as so many people wait. That's my whole goal. That's why I share my story. Uh, I know in my case, I think about all the wasted years. Mm -hmm. If somebody in my inner circle or family uh, would have noticed, oh, something's wrong, and maybe directed me in the right direction, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard not to live by shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah. And I always wondered um, how far along down the road I would be. I don't want to get emotional. If somebody would have just simply told me, or if I was educated, I had no idea. None. I think for us, it's always helping people um, not make the same mistakes that we made. Mm -hmm. And then there's also part of me that's always like, well, why can't I have been born like 15 years later because the hell that I went through. What you've gone through, what advice would you give to somebody that might find themselves in your shoes and in, the, in your parents' shoes? Yeah, I wouldn't be alive without what my parents did. And I can tell you that my parents did what they did because they had good education and good therapy. Mm -hmm. OCD is very much a family disease. Your parents are not parenting you, they're parenting their, your OCD. Your, your mother and father are not married to themselves, they're married to your OCD. They live for your OCD. Enabling and reassurance and all of those things are literally the worst thing you can do for OCD, but as a mom and a parent and, and a father, that's all you know to do. That's, that's parenting. We don't want our child to hurt. We don't want you to suffer. I think if you put it in the context for a parent of you're not hurting your child, you're hurting their OCD. Right. And that's a very important differentiator to know that if you enable, if you reassure, if you parent the OCD, it will make it worse. When you put something in your face and you deal with it, it's gonna get easier for you as time goes on. And that's what I'm doing with ERP. Okay. And it's, it's certainly helped me and made me um, deal with, like if I were to touch underneath of a table, that would usually freak me out. But now I can just touch the underneath of a table and be like, okay, I'm okay. And that's directly because of the ERP yeah, for you. Yeah, because I'm, I'm exposing myself to germs and stuff every day through ERP that I can do it in my, my life mm -hmm. now. So it's interesting when you're doing all of this work with the exposure response and you're, and you're feeling like it's not getting anywhere. Do you think that that was actually working? You just didn't know it? A or thousand you, percent. Okay. Without a doubt, there is no way that I would have gotten better without everything that had come before that. Okay. So when I was going through that stuff on the street, when I was living on my own, when I was surviving, if I hadn't had any of that background, I wouldn't have made it. So let's just get this on the table. Yeah. That anybody at any point in your life saying, oh, I am OCD or, oh, I'm, I have so much OCD about this and that. That's not connecting. That's not saying, oh, we're similar. That's minimizing That's and minimizing. not understanding. Yeah. Okay. That's the worst thing you could say. Okay. So if someone is flippant or, oh, you're just a little OCD, all those kind of um, narratives would be a great turnoff. Uh, so I would like to be respected, mm -hmm. you know, just feel I'm accepted like any other disorder that's out there, you know, no difference. Just treat us with some respect. People with OCD, we crave certainty. We have to know certainty. And this singular key to overcoming OCD is embracing uncertainty. Okay. It's being okay with uncertainty. It's not trying to feel better. It's not trying to stop the thoughts. It's not trying to stop the feelings. It's not trying to be happy all the time. It's simply being okay, not being okay. It's really important to remember that you are not your OCD. I have taken so many medications, um, I actually don't remember them all. I take paroxetine, the generic for Paxil. I am still on it. A lot of people have to try multiple medications, sometimes a cocktail of medications. I feel that I was lucky. What does your future look like from this point on? I think the biggest happiness about my future is OCD doesn't come as a factor into it. OCD had such a conversation with every choice I made, whether it was where I lived or who I talked to or when I left the house. And I think the biggest thing for me is freedom, mm -hmm. just having that freedom to make any choice I want. And it's it's difficult to explain, but you know, almost feeling captive for so long and getting to a point where the disorder isn't controlling you. It's, it, it's a level of freedom and 
just free choice that I never thought I had. And so I've done really well for myself, if, if I can say so myself, from turning it around. I mean, I was able to get an advanced, you know, master's degree, do extremely well all A's in, in, in graduate school and become an OCD therapist and now treat individuals going through the same thing. And my mom and I do a lot of advocacy together. We run a free family and loved one support group. So kind of sharing our story and insights to help other people coming up. And today I can sit here and tell you it's not easy. Right. I'm not okay, but I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm getting through it. I'm taking deep breaths where I need to take deep breaths. I'm going to therapy. My OCD is <laughs> better than it's ever been. Even before I relapsed, my mm -hmm. OCD's been way better now because I know I have those tips and tricks up my sleeve to where if I have a day where I wake up and my anxiety's bad, I can be like, okay, take that deep breath, take that step back. You can do this, you've gone through it before. Staying well from OCD, not relapse, is not about not having the thoughts, and it's not about not having the feelings. It's your response to the thoughts and feelings. It's all about not compulsing. It's all about embracing the discomfort and embracing the uncertainty. And when you do that, when you don't give oxygen to that fire, the fire shuts down real fast. There's such a lack of diversity within the OCD world, the community. I call ourselves the missing faces. And I, for me, it's so important to bring that diversity, awareness to mental illness. And I love that you're talking about it. <laughs> Thank you. Because someone's going to watch this, and they're going to see you and hear you, and they're going to feel like they're less alone, mm -hmm. and that what they're feeling is not crazy. I speak all over the world to sufferers and family members and clinicians in an effort to educate and destigmatize and make sure that nobody has to go through what I went through. The only way I can make sense out of it is to give back mm -hmm. because otherwise, what was it all for? And I don't take days for granted. Mm. I just don't allow myself to. So if there's something in my life that I'm really interested in or really care about, I fit it in and make it happen because I know what it was like to have so many years where that was just not something that I could do. And making my mom proud. She better be proud. That's one of my jobs. <laughs> of <laughs> course. Right. Part of people getting diagnosed sooner and getting the proper treatment sooner is definitely about spreading awareness and just making sure everyone knows what OCD is. Anything we can find out to help people live better lives and be diagnosed and treated sooner. New research is critical to our survival, to our continued welfare, the continued destigmatization of OCD is crucial. It's so important. I mean, these are people's lives. And I would definitely tell anybody out there that's struggling with this to not give up and to accept the fact that you're a little different, but that doesn't make you any less of a warrior than you already are. So to be able to be engaged in life, no matter what is happening, I feel this tinge of gratitude no matter what, because right. at least I'm playing, at least I'm in the game, at least I'm not on the bench. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that I'm grateful for that. I, I am so thrilled with where he is. I'm so thrilled of who he is. I'm so proud of who he is and how hard he has worked. He makes changes in people's lives. He, he really helps people and wow, to go to work and say that you really changed somebody's life is great and I'm, I'm proud every time he tells me about it or people come up to me all the time and say, wow, I'm glad we found your son, you know, I mean, my son is doing so well or something, so I like that. And how are you now? Like, how is life feeling now for you? Right now, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> if you would have asked me a couple of weeks ago, you know, it, it, it goes up and down, mm -hmm. but I've never felt um, better in my recovery uh, as I do right now. And I know it's just putting the work in and being an advocate has really, really helped me. But then there's those people that you do meet and a community that you create, that you learn that you're not alone, that you can get through this. You can understand more about yourself. You can educate other people. And that's definitely a silver lining that I've found and a blessing in disguise through all this storm. I want everybody out there to know there's hope because we did not have that. Our first, our first thing that I was told is he'd never get better. That was the first thing. And I can't even relate how devastating that was to be told that. Um, I remember sitting on my bed, looking at a picture of him and just crying like, I lost my son. What do you mean there's no hope? So 
I just like to dispel that right away. There is hope. There's treatment and there is hope. And there may be times where people feel like giving up or it's not gonna ever happen. Our journey wasn't pretty. There was definitely <laughs> some, some missteps, but we always kind of got back on our feet and made it through. So there's hope and there's help and people can get better. Mm -hmm. We deserve to be happy. We didn't ask for this. It's a challenge. For me, it's always somewhere present, but the days are good too. You know, it's not always bad. Did you, did you enjoy this? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> I was a little nervous, but... You're great. I'm oh, proud of you. you. I'll never stop going to therapy, ever. I'll go to therapy every, every week probably for the rest of my life because right. I know that's what helps me. Right. And finding that is, is truly super rewarding. And reaching out and educating yourself and educating the people around you are the best thing that I could have ever given advice to anybody. And going out to those communities and asking for help. Mm -hmm. Asking for help is n not, not a bad thing. Right. Asking for help is how you get to places like where you're, you're happy with yourself. Right. You know, getting to those places of happiness. I don't know that many people can say that they remember the first time they felt joy, but I actually remember the moment and the day and what was happening and when it happened because I don't know that I'd ever felt it before. Oh, what was it? And I was walking down the streets of Boston, and I was walking from work to home, and the sun was setting, and I looked up, and it was just a beautiful sunset. And like the colors, but I think I felt what I felt like I was supposed to feel my whole life, but never did. You know, the beauty in nature, whatever. I, I, I felt something more than just functioning throughout the day. I felt joy. I felt happiness, I felt connection, I felt serenity. I felt all of these things that I had never felt in my entire life. And in that moment, I was like, oh, that's what life's about. That's what this is about. It's not about functioning, it's not about getting through, it's not even about, it's not about going through the motions, it's about this moment right here and this feeling. And I'll always remember that moment and it'll always be very special. But what's even more special is that I've had thousands of moments just like that since then.